Today we have a very esteemed panel. Uh, you know, a lot of folks here working on many different parts of the carbon ecosystem and doing very, very interesting uh, things across the board. Uh, I will start with letting everyone introduce themselves and uh, go from there. Uh, so maybe, Beth, we can start this way and go backwards. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Great to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Beth Sandra. Um, I run product and strategy for Expensive. Hi, I'm Raphael Haupt. I'm the CEO of Tucan Protocol. I'm Annalise Downey. I'm a technical climate consultant at Silvera. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Stenmer. Uh, my friends know me as Stenmer from Denver. And uh, <laughs> I'm the CEO of Solid World. I'm really glad you said that because now I know we're friends. Oh, yeah. Uh, my name is Haley Mahler. I'm Chief Marketing Officer and a member of the founding team at Thalo. Awesome. So today's topic is about digital technologies and carbon markets. And, you know, carbon is a much newer, uh, some would say immature market. And there's a lot of scope for digital technologies to make a big difference here. And so, you know, we can start with the first question for our panelists being what kind of, uh, you know, where do you see digital technologies in carbon markets and why is the time now to implement them? I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at this. Uh, so I think the, the now piece is really interesting and I think that a lot of the innovation that we've seen in the carbon markets, especially on the technology front, sparked from in the beginning of 2021 when the TSVCM released their report looking at what it would take to scale the carbon markets. And they identified things like uh, opacity of the markets, lack of infrastructure, um, lack of liquidity in the markets, uh, lack of clarity as things that were keeping the market from scaling. And so I think a lot of, a lot of us uh, started building around that time and recognized that certain technologies notably in our case, blockchain technology, fit really well with some of the challenges that were up there. Um, so in terms of the parts of the market that we're seeing digital innovation in, it's really across the whole life cycle of a carbon credit, starting with the financing, like what you do uh, at Solid World, and then moving into MRV, where we're seeing digital tools being used to speed up the process and bring down the costs of bringing carbon credits to market. And then into the registry management space as well. CBL probably can talk a little bit about that. And then uh, what I would call kind of market solutions or, or mechanisms to make the market work better and more transparently and more efficiently, which includes both blockchain technologies like what Tucan and, and Thalo do, and also on the ratings front with, with Silvera. So we're seeing a lot of this innovation that I think got sparked from this excitement that there was a lot of scaling that could happen in this market. I think carbon in general is just an easy asset class to misunderstand. Um, there have people that have been in the industry for a long time that are familiar with kind of um, industry terms like additionality, permanence, risk, co-benefits that really um, communicate the underlying risk and quality of a carbon credit. So for context, Silvera is a carbon data platform that is aiming to incentivize real investment in climate action. And part of that is providing carbon credit ratings, but also allowing you to see which corporates have been retiring, which kinds of carbon credits and when, at what volumes, um, helping pre-issuance projects. So as we sort of understand that the availability of credits today, uh, quality is spread. There are high quality projects, there are low quality projects. Um, investments and insurance companies are aiming to go upstream to help us generate a new sort of wave of high credit, high quality credits in the market today. So helping people understand and get comfortable and familiar with this asset class, I think, is um, the role of technology and sort of minimizing uncertainties uh, so that people can navigate risk effectively. And again, that can be once the credit is issued, but also much earlier upstream. So one of the um, sort of pioneering methods that Silvera is undertaking is how we quantify above ground biomass. So this is through multi-scale LIDAR technology that is effectively weighing trees with lasers so that we have um, data that is 13 times more accurate than the traditional allometric models, which are used to sort of underlie the carbon stock estimates of our natural ecosystems. I think um, it's a great, there's a great, a lot of great points there. I think there needs to be a balance, right? I think technology often gets a bad rap because people are afraid of it, right? They don't know where to leverage it, how to leverage it, where it fits in. Blockchain is very near and dear to my heart. I spent seven years at a blockchain company. I entered the world in 2014. It is a fantastic tool, especially within these markets. On the flip side, blockchain is often a solution looking for a problem. 
right? Um, we used to speak to all the banks and the market infrastructure providers in my old company, and they would want to do a POC around everything. Anything you could throw it on a blockchain, right? And nine times out of 10, it wasn't the right use case. So what we really need to do as an industry is identify in that life cycle where these new technologies fit, educate the market on why they make sense there over legacy technologies, and then think about how you do that integration. It's not an all or nothing. We are going to have legacy infrastructure. We need legacy infrastructure to help these markets grow because there's security, there's stability, there's uh, a lot of things that, that need to still be in these markets, but you can apply the technology on top of that. So I think we need to work together to identify those pain points, and then we can figure out the right solutions and where this technology makes sense. Maybe I can take a stab at the why blockchain mm -hmm. question, because <laughs> I think it's, it's the right question to ask. And uh, I personally believe where it's not just a solution looking for a problem. And the reason in the way that I see it is that carbon credits, but all the like other environmental assets as well, are intangible by nature. And the value of a carbon credit, as you and Severa know very well, is really just the, the data that we have about that specific project, the chain of like signatures that go from like, hey, what actually happened? Uh, we verified this, etc. So we're dealing with an asset that is, we cannot like touch it. It's, it's digital actually by nature. Uh, and it has always been. And we, we're using Web1 technologies to keep track of these assets. And we don't, we don't need to. Right? We have the technology at hand today to have that traceability along the value chain from, from the financing to the origination, um, the, the MRV part, but also then the transaction data, additional market intel data like ratings, et cetera, all the way to retirements. And even for, for corporates to be saying, hey, look, these are the credits that I used to back up this claim that I made. So um, I personally think that both carbon markets and you know, blockchain markets, or often referred to as crypto markets, are kind of, kind of scammy by nature, like if we're honest. Like these are two markets that are fairly small, have seen a lot of bad actors in the space, um, and are very similar because they're both markets that are mostly driven by the expectation of what it could be in the future, right? And this is the perfect recipe for, for bubbles, for inflated expectations. And I think we've seen it both in the crypto market and in the carbon markets. And so being at that intersection, like many of us are, is really like an educational challenge of like, hey, what are we doing? Why are we using this technology? Why does it matter? And why are we trying to actually solve real pain points and real problems and not just trying to like, you know, add another layer of complexity, right? Because ultimately it's about removing layers of complexity. Yeah. And <clears throat> to add to that, I'd uh, like to bring some examples of real problems that these technologies are sol sol solving. So the current state of the carbon markets is very over the counter. And especially when it comes to financing, like when you start planting a tree to the moment where you can issue certified carbon credits, it can take you like three to five years. But these projects need working capital in the beginning. So they're spending massive amounts of time doing like enterprise sales, trying to forward sell their stuff so they can actually expand their operations. Everybody tries to be unique. There's million carbon marketplaces out there. The way I like to describe the market is like, there's a bunch of real estate portals and then there's realtors going around and showing their favorite apartments. It's very slow, it's very inefficient, it doesn't scale. If we keep having these sort of markets, we'll never reach uh, 10 billion, 50 billion, 180 billion, whatever numbers we've seen floating around by 2030. So the question is like, how do we turn these assets into commodities that people can access at scale in a trusted way, uh, in a way that they can see exactly what's backing these assets? And combining blockchain technologies and innovations with the carbon markets and actually, frankly, not carbon, but all sorts of climate assets like Rex and mass rebalance and a bunch of other stuff is where we can see these technologies emerge and drive real, actual, tangible change. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, echoing uh, a little bit what you said about the, the notion of technology being the uh, end all it can become very attractive to say, okay, this has to be blockchain. And I do absolutely see why blockchain is needed in carbon, but 
the end user almost doesn't need to worry about that. Yes. And we saw the exact same thing in insurance. We started building in 2018, and that's what Arbol's been doing. But if the end user knows or doesn't care, well, it's an abstract asset that will pay you if the bad event happens, right? It's the same idea. Like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's about accessibility and ease of use, right? Like if I log into a brokerage account, I don't care what the underlying technology is. I want it to be easy. I want it to be seamless. I want it to be frictionless. I want to trust that what I've bought is there and the movement of assets and cash will happen at the same time. So I think it's around ensuring that we can educate people that these new technologies do what we say they do. You know, we're, I think we're going to see probably an increased influx of traditional finance. Yes, we have a lot of you know, banks playing in this world, the exchanges are making announcements left, right, and center. Um, but that's gonna grow, right? We want these markets to grow, we want them to become more standardized, and I think you mentioned the word complexity, Raphael, that's the key. These are complex, nascent markets, and then we're putting complex technologies on top of them, but the goal here is to make it easier. We need to lower the barrier to entry, make it easy for people to access these markets and know what they're doing, right? And I think that's kind of the key. Isn't that the whole point of, because um, we're not going to stop complexity, right? Like, compl like we, we are at this point where the existing standards uh, like are not serving the demand for new projects, for new methodologies being developed fast enough. So we're basically, you know, we when carbon markets started 30 years ago, we had a bunch of standard bodies emerging, and then we had a, like a time where was consolidating around like a few major players. And I think we're now at the point again where we see new players entering the market, more MIB providers, et cetera. So complexity is there, complexity is growing. What we do need is a shared understanding of like how do we treat the data? How do we create comparability between like this project and this project? Because like well, it's it's just really hard to compare um, from all these different registries. Like what, what does it actually mean? So what we're trying to do with Tukin is to aggregate both the credits and the data that come with the credits, enhance that with like additional market data like Severa ratings or other Renosa ratings, B0, et cetera, so that it becomes easier for, for people to understand what's going on. And I'm fully with you, like blockchain should be in the background. Like blockchain is not a con consumer facing technology. It's, if anything, it's a back end revolution. And you know, we talk about web two and web two, you know, cloud computing is probably one of the key drivers that are behind web two, but we don't talk about like, we, we don't touch that, right? So um, I'm with you, like, let's abstract it away for the end user. You still should be able to log into your brokerage account and not know whether or not it's using blockchain in the background, but hopefully, in, like, hopefully if it's the right technology, it will replace some of these like backend processes that will just like make it easier and streamline it. But I think I think Beth, you're spot on with the with the education point. I mean, the both both the voluntary carbon market and blockchain and any of these other technologies are are complicated. And as providers, we need to educate the users of these technologies and of these markets of, of what it is that they're buying into. So I, I, I have a sense, I mean, we're here at Climate Week, right? And probably many of us have been to many panels and many events looking at the carbon market, for instance. And I think the key is talking to folks that are outside the space as well. Maybe just show of hands, like who here works in carbon markets or has been <laughs> a very, very eager gentleman over here. Uh, but so, so we need to be talking to people outside these markets who can come in because the whole idea of the, the VCM is to bring finance from people that have money and are emitting carbon to people who don't have money but can sequester carbon. And so to do that, you've got to scale it pretty significantly, and that means new people coming into the market. So I think the, the technology question is, how do you make a simpler story that folks feel welcomed in and say, I want to participate in this market. This, I understand why this particular technology makes this market uh, a safer place for me to be or to participate. Uh, I, think that's, I think that really comes down to, to the key here. I, I, I personally think that uh, most people don't actually need to know at all what technology is used in the background. It's, it's sort of like, uh, I, I agree a lot with uh, uh, Beth and Raffle that uh, it, there, there's, it's like a web-free mullet, right? It's web-free in the background, but in the front end, it's just a website. And you don't care that there's some blockchain over there. Uh, you don't care uh, how do they use it to make this stuff happen. What you care about is that 
there's real stuff there that you can access the underlying information that's needed that will help you make your critical business decisions. And one of the things we're really focusing ourselves in solid world, we're creating basically commodities markets for climate finance, uh, not only in VCM, but outside as well. And uh, we, one of the things we try to make it very clear out there is that carbon credits are like metals, right? Just like in metals, you have gold, silver, bronze, iron. Uh, in uh, carbon markets, you have like solar credits, forest conservation, reforestation, mangrove restoration. They're all completely different. They all hopefully capture or reduce carbon use. Uh, but, but in reality, they have lots of different site benefits, SDGs like biodiversity, community benefits. They have di different target customers. Uh, and it's like a whole industry in the background uh, where each and every one of them targets different users. And by creating these commodities, you can very clearly demonstrate to people that here's like a reforestation commodity, here's a mangrove restoration, renewable energy, so on and so forth. You can simplify it for the end users. Speaking to people, whether it's in the consulting space, financial institutions, corporate buyers, I would say that there's a couple pieces of information that they always are asking for. First, they want to understand the underlying risk of that project that they're, they're purchasing from. So creating a ratings that's a AAA to a D rating creates a common language of risk that people can really easily relate to because it looks and sort of feels like an S&P or a Moody's credit rating. They also care about price. Am I getting a, a sort of good deal for this um, credit that I'm buying for my long-term offtake agreement? Um, and of course, there's a reputational element, but I think for corporate buyers, what they really care about are the price and the quality of the asset. For financial institutions, they are looking to create new business models around carbon credits. They are interested in understanding where there is supply, where there is demand. And so I think the role of technology is sort of threefold, mitigating risk and creating a language um, around quality and risk, helping people understand price, and helping people understand where supply and demand are. Yeah, absolutely. Standardization. Um you know, across, we have seen this across history, that's how you get liquidity. Without standardization, there is no liquidity. Um, I guess just following up on all the stuff we've been talking about, um, you know, technology, while it has its benefits, also brings out resistance, also brings out controversy. So I guess my question to you guys, since you're at the forefront of using technology in carbon markets is what sort of uh, resistance do you face from the existing standards? What do you face in terms of the existing system, which personally, you know, I think was probably more designed for a smaller market and that has grown way, way faster than anyone anticipated. A million dollar market instead of a trillion dollar market, right? So what do you guys face and how do we scale through that? I've been sitting at the AIDA event for the past two days, and what I hear over and over again is how collaborative this market is, and um, Silvera in the early days <clears throat> was kind of a disruptor. We were sort of interrogating the underlying value of these different credits, and perhaps at the beginning there was pushback, as there is with an emerging technology, but I think that in the face of this sort of latest press cycle, and like the need for real climate commitment, there's a sort of like pulling together in the same direction and a real welcoming of different technologies and solutions to help this market scale. Yeah, we've certainly seen that as well, that there is appetite. I mean, the like brief history lesson that probably a lot of people in this room are familiar with is that in the initial efforts to bring carbon credits onto the blockchain, which, which Toucan did back in uh, fall of 2021, there was resistance to that because of the, of the way that it happened. But I think in, in the subsequent conversations that are happening, especially with the registries, for instance, there's a lot of understanding of how this technology can be helpful and a lot of willingness to learn and adopt but they want to do it in a careful way and a considered way because they have you know, a, a hangover from times when the carbon market has lost a lot of trust and has taken years to rebound. So we, I mean, we have, we have done lunch and learns with Gold Standard, for instance, where we've gone in and answered questions that they have about the technology. And you're right, the user doesn't need to know the back end, how everything works, but the partners that we work with really do. They really do need to be comfortable with the technology. And we're seeing a lot of, a lot of interest and movement and, um, and I think progress on that front. And it's slower than anyone wants, but if you're building something for the long term, it sometimes takes a long time. 
We've certainly seen uh, skepticism towards uh, the blockchain use as well. Uh, I, I literally two days ago, I met a guy at the party and uh, I told him we're creating commodities in carbon and we chatted a bit and he was at one point he said, well, I hope you're not using blockchain. And I, I started laughing and then I said, what do you think of blockchain? He said, colossal waste of time. <laughs> uh, and uh, but you know, frankly, I didn't bother to explain to him that we're using the blockchain because <laughs> I do believe that at the end of the day, he will use us and he won't even know it <laughs> because that's how the system should be built. Ultimately, he probably uses a spreadsheet that's shared. <laughs> it's close enough. It's amazing how this is such an emotional topic, right? Like, <laughs> it's like wow. We're talking about the technology and it triggers these like really strong emotions in people. So, um, I mean, we've seen both resistance and um, a lot of collaboration. And I would say we've seen also resistance for the right reasons. We've seen resistance for questionable reasons. Um, I would say, you know, when, so tokenization, like I think the first carbon credits have been tokenized in 2017 and nobody cared. So the, um, so, Kuken wasn't the first one to do that. I think um, what happened back in fall 2021 is that a lot of carbon credits have been tokenized. And um, this was bigger than like anybody had imagined. And so I think actually it was the right call by Barra to say, hey, oh my god, like 5% of our inventory have been tokenized here. Um, we, it's something we haven't paid attention, so we you know, didn't really care. We, we have to find, we, we have to do this the right way. So actually we welcomed the um, what we've always wanted with Tukin is like, hey, how can we create a process that is bi-directional that we can actually um, you know, bring credits on chain, move them back to the registries? Because really what we're talking about when we talk about tokenization is just a transfer from one registry system to another registry system. So it's the same thing when the CDM credits were moved into the Vera registry. Like just, it's, we need just a, a form of how do we move a credit from one database to another database, right? So, uh, I'm actually pretty happy that we're like in phase two of this of, of this market, where um, the standards are really open to that. Some more than others. Um, if you're staying here, I'm going to have a fireside chat with Sarah from Gold Standard later at I think 1 p.m. So um, you know, I'm going to focus on like her perspective, like from like Gold Standard. How you know how was that to witness from 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 like a reputable traditional player in the market. And so I, I do think that we've seen the right, um, like the right questions have been asked and there's generally like an openness, but also the speed at which it's happening is obviously hard for startups to, uh, to incorporate into our everyday life, right? So I think this is the, the only tension I would see, I think it's overall moving in the right direction but we're running out of time, and I feel like I, I do feel that urgency myself. I, th I think we need to be prepared to embrace innovation and not be scared of it, right? We are a market infrastructure provider at Expansive. We have 95% of global uh, voluntary carbon traded on us. We are trusted to provide liquidity, transparency to markets. We don't necessarily have to be the ones sitting at the center doing all of this innovative stuff. We can be partnering with those that are. You know, we partner with Silvera. I would like to partner with other people on this panel. Um, it is important that we come together, and it doesn't. Again, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. We can we can demonstrate that we are creating trustworthy markets, and then partner with those that are providing innovative solutions. Right at the end of the day, though, we're not tokenizing board apes. Right, <laughs> we are talking about real world markets, real money um, that is changing hands, and we have to be thoughtful about how we do this. And we have to make sure that whatever we roll out is suitable and fit for purpose. And I think the only way we can do that is by educating one another and educating the market infrastructures on why technology and innovation is important and us educating the startups and the innovators on why you need trusted market infrastructure, why you know, no bank is gonna sign off on a massive deployment of capital without their risk and compliance departments being happy, right? So it's very two-sided, and I think when the two come together and meet in the middle, that's when this market will be able to scale. I just wanna add one thing on that, because something you just said sparked something I heard on a panel yesterday that I loved, which was that carbon credits evolving is a feature, not a bug. 
And I think that's uh, just the, the whole rationale of what you need for why technology in these markets is so important because they are continuing to evolve as we have better technology, as we have better information, more communication with communities on the ground in the case of nature-based credits, for instance. Uh, and then just going back to the original question about kind of how the evolution has gone with maybe more, uh, more startup type of disruptors and the existing market, what I will say on the registry front also is I mean, we, we do have a, a two-way operational bridge with three registries right now, which are biocarbon, <laughs> the whistle, uh, which is bio, biocarbon registry, Puro.Earth, and most recently, Social Carbon. And these are newer registries, smaller registries, and they're able to work really nimbly with us to show what a, what a piece of technology looks like if you work with a registry to bring a carbon credit from a registry onto the blockchain and be able to send it back as well. So that has been really useful in helping demonstrate to some of the larger registries, the more entrenched players that are a little bit more, or have a, a sort of lower risk appetite to see how it works and to ask questions and to go to those registries and say, you know, can you, can you tell us how you did this? Did you develop an API? Do we need to hire a developer to do that, et cetera? So I think there's, there's a lot of collaboration to the earlier point behind the scenes that I'm very excited about. Right, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's important to just keep in mind that when you have new technologies come, the evolution part will happen, it will have resistance, but it is also, uh, it is exactly a feature, not a bug. And I, I think we, we have seen that in a lot of other markets where new technologies are disrupting across the board. And you know, I guess in the case of carbon, we've talked about blockchain, are there any other technologies that come to mind that you think will be very impactful? Maybe they're not exactly now, but coming up, where do you guys see the whole ecosystem of technology in this market? I do think that <clears throat> blockchain by its nature is incredibly collaborative. Uh, uh, those people that are deep in the space and understand it technically, uh, understand that it's, it's okay. like pieces of money Legos that you can build on top of each other. Uh, what I see in the future is that us and Tukan will be incredibly tightly integrated so you won't even tell the difference if you're you jumping between the different platforms and you may end up in Talos interface or expansive and all of it runs in the background in completely seamless invisible way and it has all the important information attached to it like so where are ratings uh, that you can just access on demand with strict versioning history in an immutable form uh, where you can see exactly what changes when and how were made. Uh, and we see a lot of these AI plays coming up right now, right? AI is hot currently. And I certainly see AI has a huge role to play in uh, reducing cost, automation, and bringing in scale at the data gathering and processing. Uh, D-Climate is working on the data layer solutions. Uh, so all of these solutions must and will play together reach the natural flow of technology progression. I mean, I'm really excited about Earth observation technologies and how the upcoming different kinds of satellite missions that are coming to help us measure biomass, but also perhaps less sexy, we're entering a new era of climate disclosure, which means that a sort of generation of analysts has a new sort of set of data to become familiar with, to understand scope one, two, and three emissions, to understand climate transition risk. And so there's lots of data products that are going to be built on top of that will, that will ultimately have um, impact on the carbon markets. Yeah, I think um, AI is a very complementary technology to, to what we're doing. Um, I think, you know, Stanley, you guys use it to analyze risk of like project project risk, uh, climate risk on, on um, when it comes to project development, et cetera. So I do think that um, I'm of the same opinion. It's like these are, these are small, you know, services that we're going to implement and integrate into different parts of the value chain. And that will just make our life easier and, you know, going to reduce the complexity um, and just allow us to do more things at a lower cost and more quickly. Yeah, I think it's a combination of these technologies, you know, we talked about blockchain, AI, I think smart contracts, being able to add more information around these assets. I mean, that's what we're talking about here, right? Increasing transparency, providing more information so people can make better informed decision making, right? And I think you can, you, 
put these technologies together, and that's when you start seeing those outcomes. Yeah. Um, and as you get new technologies, the other thing is you have to be, in some ways, backwards compatible. Like we talked about bank compliance departments, and we deal with this insurance companies all day. You know, yes, this is shiny, this is new, but it still kind of has to fit something that looks like the old. Um, and so that's going to be the key challenge here, right? So over the next, and this is more broadly, over the next 10 years, where do you see carbon markets ending up? That's our final question. Really, really broad. This is, this is such a hard question. Who wants to take it first? Let's all say something different. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna start if nobody wants to. Um, so I think that the way that I think about it is like, Carbon markets, we, we need carbon markets. Like it's, we, we you know, I think we're, we're running out of time to address climate change and markets are for now the best instrument that we know to allocate resources at scale and that's what we need to do. So um, I, even though I'm like an idealist at heart on some of these things, I do think that ultimately we, we have to use the tools that we have at our disposal to solve this, to solve climate change. So um, for me, in 10 years time, what I do hope is that car markets are serious. Like it's a serious market and it's not like, you know, like such a small niche that the bigger institutions don't even care looking at it, right? So, and I do think that, I hope that regulation will have come into the mix as well. Um, I think that the voluntary and the compliance market can and will ultimately merge if, um, if we're doing a good job, and um, yeah, and then I just hope that it's it's part of our financial like stack. So it's like ideally this is not something that is its own market, and that, you know, for me personally, that is what refi ultimately is supposed to do. It's about um, integrating regenerative practices into the fabric of uh, the tools that we use every day, the applications that we use every day, the the value flows, etc. Right. So. I'd much rather have a carbon market that is not based on the emissions that a company has, but the, the value, for instance, that is being captured. So I'm a, I'm a bit much bigger fan of a carbon tax than I am of like this like per emission accounting. Uh, and so, you know, if we had a, a you know, a, a tax or like a, a small portion within the smart contract that every time there's value being transacted, a part of it goes towards like an an index of uh, of projects that are curated and like using data, and this is tripling down to projects on the ground, and we have that all the whole like um, chain of like the, the, the chain of data and and and, and money uh, all the way to local communities, and we can actually trust that the impact is real. I mean, that would be awesome. Um, and I think ten years is is it's it's far away. I think we always underestimate how much can change in ten years, and um, you know, only if we look at the last two years, like so many things have changed. So um, I think there's, there's definitely reasons to be optimistic of like where this market can go and what it can become. I, go ahead. I can't think 10 years ahead. I don't really want to think about 10 years ahead. So, so I'm going to focus It'll on It'll be one year ahead. That's OK, too. <laughs> but I mean, carbon credits are the net in net zero. And so there's a, an ambition gap that corporates have to bridge as you know, some governments like the UK and Rishi Sunak have sort of stepped down their sort of national commitments, climate um, commitments from corporates has to step up to help bridge the gap. And carbon markets are an effective way of doing that. But we can't wake up in 2030 and say, hey, I've done everything that I can to reduce my emissions within my value chain, and, and now I expect the carbon market to be functioning. We have to continue to send a demand signal every year along the way, and part of that is um, using the tools that we have today and the credits that we have available today. I think it is going to become a much more mainstream market, and I think maybe quicker than we think, because we can learn a lot of lessons from other markets that have taken a lot longer to standardize. You know, we're not starting by writing technology in COBOL, like a lot of these bank systems are in place. We're not trying to figure out how to do that reconciliation and back office processing. The foundations are already there for us. So we can learn a lot of lessons from traditional finance, and I think we can kind of almost bypass that, and then we can start embracing all of this innovation and while providing trust and veracity and integrity of these markets, and then I think we can probably get to more mainstream a lot quicker because we, as, as long as we make sure that we do learn from those lessons and leverage them. Yeah, I, I agree very much with that. Like I hope we get to a more mainstream place. 
Uh, I'll also paraphrase Al Gore paraphrasing Rudy Dornbush, which is that things take a lot longer to happen than you ever think they will. And then once they start happening, they have happen faster than you ever thought they could. And I think that will happen with the voluntary carbon market. I think we'll see a lot more mainstreaming, a lot more participation, a lot more capital coming in. And then hopefully, at some point, we don't need them at all anymore because we've solved climate change and we can go spend our time doing other things. <laughs> yeah, I agree as well that the carbon, carbon markets, voluntary carbon market, we believe is like training wheels for the actual regulated market. Uh, the regulation will come in, but I think the uh, markets and certificates that we've created in the last 20 years are, uh, it, it, it's, it's sort of like uh, shows you where the future will actually be. And there's actually a lot of players already moving beyond carbon into mass rebalance and other certificates tracking. I believe at some point we'll reach the point where if you go buy something from the shop, I don't know, you have QR code or something like that for every product you buy, you scan it and you can see exactly where it came from, who benefited from it, who were the middlemen, all the intermediaries in that chain. Uh, you can see people at their purchasing decisions literally see at any point what sort of impacts and choices they're affecting and they can dig deeper into the data and the information, how that come, came to be. And all of that information will be access, accessible from your mobile phone or I don't know, maybe at that point we'll have some head chips or something. So at like with a push of a button. So yeah, the tracing and tracking and uh, information access and everything is evolving at ridiculous speeds. And we can already see that starting to happen. And it's a matter of time until it will reach all the way to the end consumers at the shopping level. But I'd do like to make one more quick announcement. So just literally this morning, uh, we released our second market. So we created a gold standard uh, cookstoves commodities market for forward financing these projects which is a huge achievement for us. So that's setting up like two markets in four months that now we, we've been live. So if you guys want to support cookstoves, or if you have cookstoves, or uh, you want some cookstoves, <laughs> then get in touch with me. Can you say cookies instead of cookstoves? Yes, that's how we actually so if you want cookies, go see Gold standard, standard cookies. <laughs> well, that's awesome. and. Uh, I've been told that time is up. So thank you, everybody here. This was excellent. And uh, thank you. Thanks for having us.